from the airport to my dad's house and this woman calls me and she says, um, Jennifer, and she was panicking. She's like, my bees have died, they're all dead and I need you to help me figure out what happened. So she starts explaining it and her name was, well, they're not mature name. She's not in here, is she? S. <laughs> but anyway, she says that my colleague dies and she's given me kind of the symptoms of what it was, and it sounded like classic Varroa issues. Kind of like what Dewey's talking, you know, you get the, the snot through, the deformed wing, and when the girls are sick, what do they do? They leave. They leave home. And she, and so I told her, I said, I really believe, because she said she had done nothing for Varroa because she had read that she didn't need to because it was a first year colony and that she didn't need to even think about Varroa mites her first year. And I said, well, that's not necessarily the case because you might have bought, when you bought that colony or that nuke or that package, it could have had a high Varroa load. So you never know. But anyway, she was convinced it wasn't Varroa. She told me that she had read on the internet what it was. It was the eclipse. I searched, and I'm still looking to try to find this article, or this post, or this blog. Has anyone read it? Anyone read? You have? Do we? Jennifer Saruta said that the eclipse killed bees? But it didn't. It didn't. But no, apparently this said it killed bees, and that's why her colonies were dead. And it also crumpled the wings. <laughs> so have you heard that one? No. <laughs> so anyway, hey dude, it's good to see you. I haven't I went to give you a hug, but you were you were busy saying. Um, anyway, so where's my little thing? Here we go. Thank you very much. By the way, awesome, awesome group, the Texas Beekeeping Association. Y'all have been wonderful. Have blessed. Thank you, everybody is treating me so wonderful. Um, we do, you know, you, you, well, as speakers, as Dewey and I know, we do a lot of meetings, and sometimes they're not very good, are they? I mean, sometimes you show up and you don't know where you're staying, you don't know where the meeting is, you don't, and so thank you if they've just kind of held my hand and here's where you're staying and got me anyway, so thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, so, I'm not going to talk a lot about Varroa. I went into it yesterday in an hour and a half detail about the fact that it is killing our bees, plain and simple. It's the number one reason why, why our bees are dying. And as you can see here, you can see the crumpled wings caused by the eclipse, <laughs> right there. Um, so we've been looking at Varroa, I've been studying Varroa now for 20 years. I wish I didn't have to study it anymore, I wish it would go away. Um, I'm, I said yesterday, I'm tired of talking about it, I'm tired of studying about it, I'm tired of dealing with it in my personal colonies, in my research colonies, and I can't imagine the poor bees, because they're having to deal with it as well. And when that mite jumped from Apis serrana to Apis mellifera, it changed their lives forever, and ours as beekeepers as well. So that is why our bees are dying, that mite right there. And the, the newer research in the last couple of years about how it's feeding, how it's actually feeding on the fat bodies of the, of the bee as opposed to the hemolymph. I mentioned yesterday, I asked, are uh, Barone mites vampires or are they werewolves? And everybody in the room raised their hand to vampires. Well, actually, we know now that they're werewolves. They are not feeding on the hemolymph. They're actually feeding on the fat bodies of our poor little bees. So, what can we do? I know Dewey talked about some methods, and I'm going to go into oxalic acid. It's the newest approved compound that we have. We have thymol, a whole bunch of other things, but this is our newest approved compound. It's been used in Europe and in Canada for decades. Um, it has been used here in the United States as well uh, for quite some time, but it just got EPA, USDA, FDA, whatever approval. So what is oxalic acid? Well, it is an acid. It is found naturally in plants. It makes them taste sour and nasty to herbivores. So when they start chewing on that plant, they're like, Ugh. 
I don't want to eat this. Um, it's found nationally, I'll show you uh, here in a minute, but in buttercups and spinach and rhubarb. It's also found in our environment, in our diet, and in honey. It is not a lipid, therefore it will not be absorbed or sequestered in our wax. It's safe and easy to apply if done properly, which we'll talk about here. And oxalic acid is about 10,000 times stronger than acetic acid or vinegar. And I, I just had the point, right? It does? Oh, there it is. Okay. Down here, and I can't read it because I didn't put my glasses on, but somewhere down here is formic acid, which has a higher pH than oxalic acid, which is up here at the law the top. So it is the strongest of all of our acids. How is it killing, uh, killing those little mites? Not 100% sure, the research is still out, but right now they believe that these crystals are actually absorbed through the pads, uh, the tarsal pads of the varroa mite, therefore entering the body and causing the mite to die. And it does kill mites. It's a wonderful compound. Here's some of the, the veggies that have the oxalic acid in them. We have stuff like asparagus and broccoli, Brussels sprouts, collards, uh, beet leaves. All of this is in our, in our winter garden, isn't it? How many of y'all have your winter garden up and running? Yeah. We had ours until the deer came in about a week ago. So I had to replant everything. In one night, either the, it's either, and I want to ask y'all about these little, um, you know, possums on a half shell. Armadillo. <laughs> when did y'all let it out of Texas? Because it's now in Georgia. Oh, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Uh, but it goes through, it went through my garden last year and in one night plowed up everything. And yeah, so we stand off our deck looking for armadillos at night. Oh no, I've got, we have feral hogs. Matter of fact, two years ago, I was going to my mom's for Thanksgiving, and I saw this thing running through the field, and I'm like, oh, someone's cow is loose. And it's running towards the road, and I stopped because it was gonna run right in front of me, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, what is that? And I'm so, of course, now I'm trying to drive and take a photo. Don't recommend that, because you run into the wild hog. Actually, I didn't, but it was a, I, I, a huge hair on the back, big old thing. But anyway. So this is some of the veggies um, that we have that have the, have the oxalic acid. Spinach, ha ha, I am what I am. Uh, typical, that's supposed to be a joke. I'm supposed to lie. <laughs> or wake up at whichever. It would wake you all up at whichever. But anyway, oxalic acid is, is, is out there. Um, now this right here is illegal to use, okay? This is wood leech, this is something you can pick up at the paint supply store, and I know nobody in this room has ever done that or used this. Why is this illegal? It is off label, it does not have a label. The reason we put labels on things is to protect ourselves, uh, to protect our environment, and to protect the bees. And that, so we want to all thank Brushy Mountain for actually registering oxalic acid. Years ago, I heard about oxalic acid from Dr. Marion Ellis at a meeting, and he was telling me how difficult it was going to be to get oxalic acid registered because of this. It takes hundreds of thousands of dollars to register a product, to get it through EPA or FDA or USDA or whatever. It takes a lot of money. So companies like Daydant or whoever didn't necessarily, I'm not cutting them down by any means, but they didn't want to up, put that money up front, a half a million dollars, when they know that they're never going to make that money back. Because as beekeepers, we are always trying to find a better way, aren't we? Our own way, okay? Maybe a cheaper way. And so if we can go down and buy this product here, I, I'm just going to make this number up, I don't know, $5, but it treats 100 colonies or more. Okay, think of what they would have to charge for that product. For instance, in here, they would have to charge you to make that money back. They would have to charge a lot, right? And it's going to take them years and years and decades. And when we are going, wait a minute, 
why would I spend ten dollars for something that's going to treat ten colonies when I can go buy this for five dollars and it's going to treat a couple hundred colonies? So that's why. <clears throat> and then, uh, so what Brushy Mountain did, uh, they got they basically what EPA did and USDA because they're holding the registration, they piggybacked on research from Canada. So that way it could be fast tracked through, it could get approved, and then we can legally use oxalic acid in our colonies. So this is where, this is the product, and I do recommend if you're going to use oxalic acid, especially for the first time, that you buy this product and you follow because it has all the instructions, how to do it. We're gonna go into that a little bit, but I would recommend this because it's the safe way to do it, okay? Um, and you don't want to kill yourself, your bees, or that armadillo running through your apiary, at least. <laughs> so anyway, right now there are three approved methods of oxalic acid for varroa control, uh, all of which need to be applied when little to no brood is present. Oxalic acid does not penetrate the cappings. So anything under those cappings is not going to be affected by oxalic acid. All right, so you really need to do this when the colonies are broodless. We have the, the sublim or, I'm sorry, we have the dribble method or the trickle. We have the sublimation or vaporization, and we have the spray. So let's go into each of these. So here's the directions for how to use the trickling method. You want to prepare a solution by dissolving 35 grams of oxalic acid. Now all of this, again, is going to be on that label when you purchase that package from Brushy Mountain. But you want to dissolve, and what I'm going to give you a little tip here, dissolve the oxalic acid, those crystals, first in hot water. It doesn't need to be boiling, but hot water, okay? Then add your sugar. And what you're doing, you're creating a one-to-one sugar-to-water solution. All right, so then add your, your but you've got to make sure all of that oxalic acid is completely dissolved. All right, then add your sugar. In my area of the country, we treat between Christmas and New Year's because that's usually a time, I can't guarantee it, but that's usually at a time that our colonies are at the lowest amount of brood. They're not going to be necessarily 100% broodless, but it's going to be hopefully at the least amount of brood because come January, that's when we start having that brood production increase. All right, because the queen is anticipating spring and so she's starting to kick into gear and then we usually have the red maple starts blooming into January, first part of February and boy, they really, I mean, then you have frames or sheets and sheets of brood. So look at your eight year, figure out your region, because I know North Texas is very different from South Texas. I lived here, okay, I know. And so figure out your time, when would be the best time for you to apply any of these oxalic acid products. Um, and also, um, like I said, I'm gonna keep saying this, it's most effective in brewless colonies. And treat, when you do the dribble method, you wanna treat when uh, temperatures are between 35 and 55. And that's when those bees are clustered. They've got a tight cluster. Because what happens is as you're dribbling down or trickling that oxalic acid solution onto them, it needs to be moved through the cluster. If they're all spread out and it's 60 degrees and they're running all over the colony, you're not going to get that oxalic acid on all of the bees. That's why they need to be in that tight cluster. Always wear eye protection. You do not want this spraying into your eyes and wear gloves. You do not want this solution on your skin. It is very quick, about a minute and a half per colony to apply, and you're gonna apply five to six mils trickled between the occupied seams, okay? Right in between here. There we go. So you're gonna trickle it right down in between each one of those frames and within those seams there. And you want to obviously locate the cluster so that you're getting the majority of that oxalic acid on the cluster. All right, our next approved method, oxalic acid vaporization or sublimation. This is a wand, and um, I think this is the, uh, might be the OxyVap. There's a lot of different products out there. 
And what happens is you put the crystals in this little heating chamber, you plug it up to a battery, um, and then that will heat up those crystals, forming this vapor, this gas. You're putting it at the entrance of the colony, and this gas is going to move up in through the bees, through that cluster, and hopefully kill all your mites. Okay? Again, it needs to be broodless. That colony needs to be broodless in order for this to work. So, how many of you all, or you don't have to raise your hand, but if you want, how many of you all are using this oxalic acid vapor three times seven days apart? Anybody trying that? And I know you are, you are, and I know you talked about it and you said you're having pretty good success with it. We did a study, and I, 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 I lost my slide, and I was trying to make up another one back in the back of the room, I didn't have time. I don't know what happened to it. But what we did, we took 90 colonies, and we took half of them and used formic acid, and we took the other half and we used the oxalic acid three times, seven days apart. Now, we had taken before beginning my, my population and then ending my population, beginning brood and stuff like that, ending brood. But anyway, we wanted to see how well that works. And initially, it dropped those mite loads down very low, okay, well below the economic threshold okay, of one mite per 100 bees. And that was May when we did that. We came back and looked at it again in August. Okay, and we did the same thing. We did alcohol washes, we did powdered sugar rolls. No, we did alcohol washes, that's right. And we counted mites again. And what did we find? We found that those mite loads had far exceeded into, the, uh, into not quite the economic injury level, but well above the economic threshold. So it worked initially, but all those mites under, the, under that capping, because it's a flash treatment, okay? It's gonna happen very quickly, and then it's gonna go away. So it's only gonna get those phoretic mites, those ones that are transported around on the adults. Those reproductive mites are gonna be unaffected. Okay, so, flash, boom. We knock down mites, but 20, 30 minutes later, a day later, you still have mites emerging, don't you? And those mites are running around, and they're feeding, and then they're gonna drop back down into a cell. You're gonna treat again, you're not gonna get them. So what we recommend, is that you cage the queen, or you create a brutal situation. Years ago, a group of Italians came over from Italy because they had just received, or not received, but they had just gotten uh, small hive beetles. And so they wanted to learn how to deal with small hive beetles. So I'm telling them about what we do, and then I ask, well, hey, you tell me about your varroa control. What do you all do there? And they say, well, we treat twice a year, we treat in the summer with oxalic acid vaporization, and we treat in the winter with oxalic acid dribble. And the reason they did the dribble in the winter because it was saved so much time, because using the oxalic, now these were commercial beekeepers. Okay, these, these were commercial beekeepers. They said it takes too much time for us to go through all the colonies in the winter with that, with that vapor wand, because it takes about 10 minutes per colony for any of y'all who've used it. Because you've got to set it up, you've got to, Put it into the entrance, you've got to close the in, fill it, close it, heat it, vaporize it, cool it, reload it. <laughs> so it takes time. It works very well, but it does take a little more time. So that's why they were doing the sugar or the dribble in the winter and then the vapor, because in the summer months they're not in cluster. Okay? And what they would do is they would cage the queen um, and then release her on day 14 and then treat on day 21. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because what have we done? We have broken that brood cycle. So everything on day 21 is now phoretic. You've got to make sure that you're treating on that day before those cells that that queen is now laid are going to be recapped. So you want to make sure you treat on day 21. Now, the cage that they use, this is a cage, and I'm, I've asked Rushy Mountain to look into it, um, and then, but this is something you can make as well. They actually, they, they had a cage and they also had a frame. And with the frame, just a regular frame, they had put queen excluder material on both sides. And then put the queen down in there, and they would put nurse bees sometimes with her or not, 
Because, because with her, she's going to be trapped, but bees are going to be coming and going, right? So they're going to keep her clean, they're going to take care of her, they're going to feed her. Um, and they're also moving that QMP around, aren't they? As opposed to a solid cage, okay, they're able to move that QMP around a little more readily. So they didn't have as many issues with queen cells. But I would recommend on, on when you treat on day 21, prior to treating or maybe go in a day before and look at look for queen cells because you could possibly have queen cells but with this cage with this queen excluder material moving around they did not they said they occasionally had queen cells but they, it was not a huge issue so we want to create a break in the brood cycle somehow or again use this when there is no brood present all right so I've, okay how many times can i say that <laughs> A few more times. All right, we can also treat packages, um, say just shortly after we've installed them, okay, because there will not be any brood at that point. Oh, and I, I forgot to mention, sorry. You want to use that vapor either uh, in the evening hours, okay, when the sun has gone down, there's still enough light, or towards the end of the day or early in the morning if it's kind of chilly, because you want the majority of your bees to be home, all right? So try to do it when the majority of your bees are going to be home. Okay, so we can also say we dump our bees into, a, into, a, into our hives. We can treat with the OA vapor at that point because no brood is present, right? There's not going to be any cat brood for probably at least a week, if not more, depending on when you release the queen. We also say that when we're requeening with a queen cell, um, we, can, we, can do, uh, we can go ahead and treat on day 20 or 21. The same when we make walkaway splits where they're going to be uh, creating their own queen, okay, we can create, so anytime that there's little to no brood, and y'all, y'all know this, when there's little to no brood, that's when it's a good time to go ahead and use the oxalic um, vaporization, especially in the summer months. All right, so dribble versus sublimation, we have dribble, let's look at the pros and the cons. So, it does work, it does kill mites. Uh, it's very safe to apply. It's quick, which I like. Very little equipment is needed, and you don't have to buy the expensive wand or batteries, etc. But what are the cons? It does require opening the hive, because you've got to open up the lid or uh, take off the super to find the cluster. It may be problematic in freezing weather, but it, it, it obviously is going to be easier with a helper, because you're taking, you might have to take the super off. Now let's look at the sublimation or vaporization. This has a better efficacy, okay, than the dribble. There's research that came out of Europe that shows that. It's not a huge, a huge number, but they do, the, the research does show that the sublimation does work better. You don't have to open a hot because you're putting that wand in the entrance. Uh, you can do during freezing weather. And uh, it is gentler on the bees because when you're, when you're applying the dribble, Okay, that oxalic acid is in, it's mixed with that sugar syrup, right? And it's directly going onto the bee. And that may have some kind of detrimental effects on the, the bee's exoskeleton. Okay, maybe dissolving some of that, that, that chitin or whatever. All right. Um, and you don't have to mix any syrup. What are the, the cons? The fog is hazardous. Um, you have got to be very, very careful when using the oxalic acid vapor. How many? He's asking about small high beetles. We did see occasionally some dead small high beetles on, on the shop towels. And then, too, when we would do sublimation, uh, sometimes I would notice a, a, a number of dead beetles on the, on the bottom board when we would do our, you know, doing the vaporization. What effect it's having, I don't know. It's just purely, you know, just observation right now. But we did see some, we did see, but I actually we're thinking about doing that this winter, going in some colonies and sucking up a bunch of beetles and putting them in some, in some Petri dishes and throwing oxalic acid at them and seeing. So, all right, I think it is lunchtime. And I know, thank you all, Texas, and the Texas Beekeeping Association. Really appreciate it.